one actually cannot get away with borrowing and borrowing and borrowing, and hence the need for prudent government spending in all its aspects. Singapore is a small, open economy, a city-state with no natural resources. So I think that first and foremost, it is a realisation of what Singapore is and of the constraints of being a small city-state with no natural resources. The constraint is that there is a very small domestic market. Hence, there is a need actually to export our goods. There is a need in a sense to make use of what the world can offer in terms of markets, technology, capital and so on and hence an openness to foreign technology, to foreign capital, even to foreign professional workers to come here to work. The second aspect I think is that because of the fact that we are so small, we have in many ways only one resource ultimately and that's our people. So to realise that human resource development and education is probably the most important uh, fundamental factor in Singapore's economic development. The third aspect is I think with regards to government policy and government spending and that is the fact that one actually cannot get away with borrowing and borrowing and borrowing and hence the need for prudent government spending in all its aspects. So I would say that these would be the three fundamental factors accounting for Singapore's economic success. Today it's the most densely populated state in the world. In 1819 when the British set up a trading post on the island they found a settlement of 150 here and wild animals roaming its jungles and marshes. It was made a free port, trade flourished and since independence in the late 50s this multicultural community of Singaporeans has carefully nurtured and developed its legacy as an international focal point of business and trade. Singapore has always been strategically placed. It has after independence uh, under a very I think skillful leadership of the Singapore government, Lee Kuan Yew, in the first place, they have succeeded to take advantage of this geographic position. Plus, that they have realized that uh, the economy of Singapore will be much more quickly developed if you concentrate on creating possibilities for exports. Not like many other poor countries in the past decided to try to change their economy to substitute imports by own domestic industries. Singapore has always been outward looking, wanting to facilitate trade over the borderlines. Uh, Singapore is one of the most ardent spokesmen for free trade in the world. There are practically no tariffs in this country. This liberal approach is complemented by a disciplined society. It isn't by chance, for example, that Singapore is one of the cleanest cities in the world. Throwing so much as a cigarette end away can lead to a hefty fine. Other laws restrict smoking, gambling, chewing gum and the right to strike. Legislation has also helped the authorities come to grips with a previously rampant narcotics problem. Possessing and selling morphine or heroin can today lead to the death sentence. The goal is such that Anything that stands in the way, chewing gum or ethnic problems or whatever, will be very sternly dealt with. I think, again, all these regulations and so on will have to be understood in terms of the overall philosophy of state before individual. This little island nation, barely 640 square kilometres in land area, has a standard of living comparable to any developed nation. But you need go no further than to the old parts of the city, in the process of renewal, to be reminded of the scale and speed of Singapore's growth, and to experience the melting pot of people behind its economic miracle. Over 75% of Singaporeans are Chinese, 15% Malays, and about 7% Indians. 
But there are also some 60,000 ethnic Arabs, Japanese, as well as Europeans. They display an energy and work ethic that's all the more remarkable when you remember that Singapore is in the humid tropical belt with average daytime temperatures of up to 30 degrees Celsius. Singaporeans are said to be the only peoples in equatorial areas to dispense with a siesta after lunch, with some exceptions, of course. I would say Singaporeans are very proud of their country. They are amazed at their own prosperity. And Singaporeans travel very widely to the countries in the region and will be able to come back and make comparisons to their own advantage. So I think we have reached a stage when there is genuine admiration, gratitude to the government for giving us what uh, it, has, it has. But, now this is a big but here. I think that in terms of material prosperity, there is just no question about Singapore's success and well-being and so on. But that's the other side, the less tangible things, the things that are less quantifiable, you know, more qualitative. So when it comes to things like, um, are Singaporeans extremely happy? Do they have a sense of identity, right? a multi-ethnic society? Is there this total cohesion that makes everybody happy? Now, there are still, I think, question marks. For example, there is the flip side of our material prosperity. Has it thrown up a whole generation of Singaporeans who are selfish, materialistic, mindless of tradition, who are very self-centered, in fact, who are beginning to be called ugly Singaporeans? We don't want to use this term too much. Right? But there is a certain trait, for example, that we have begun to identify in ourselves. And it is not a very attractive trait, I'm afraid. It is this grasping, totally materialistic um, quality that makes Singaporeans very calculating, over-pragmatic, maybe not too adventurous, a little bit closed, a little bit reluctant to take risks, and certainly very uh, uh, jealous of their own self-interest. Right? Uh, we are told that this happens in all societies, you know, but uh, this is something that certainly worries us a little. Singapore is heterogeneous. I think uh, because of the existence of Chinese, Malays and Indian and many religions, Buddhism, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, you will find that these could be possible sources of tension and conflict and minority issues could always surface. And certainly some minority parties that choose to build their support on a minority vote have used religion language in the past and sometimes do raise this now and again to win votes. Outwardly, the multiplicity of religions in Singapore manifests itself in most lively ways with a wide variety of festivals and other celebrations which the authorities fully encourage. By far the most dominating religions are Taoism and Buddhism, but that doesn't stop people joining in each other's celebrations, such as the Christian New Year, as we see here. Singapore was a British colony for, you know, more than a hundred years. And uh, once we became independent, the government took a decision to keep English as the language of business and the civil service and government. It is the language of the modern sector. To that extent, 